Hello, I'm Dr. Kelly McFarland, and this is Headlines in History from the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, where we digest the most important updates from the world of diplomacy and foreign policy and take a short dive into the history of one of the most pressing issues of the day. So the stories we're going to talk about today include a trip to China by California Governor Gavin Newsom. We're also going to talk about the Biden administration's nuclear talks with China and give you guys some diplomatic news out of the Pacific. And then at the end, we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the latest flurry of developments in the world of artificial intelligence with Georgetown expert Andrew Embry. My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. I also believe that events in Iraq have reminded America of the need to use diplomacy. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. Morning, Freddie. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks, Kelly. How are you doing? Oh, not too bad. Um, had a good weekend. Uh, we took the kids to go see a really cool art exhibit downtown uh, DC this weekend at Art Tech House. They had uh, a bunch of, it was a space thing and images from the web telescope and stuff. And my kids loved it. And the Cleveland Browns won. So they're five and three as we sit here recording right now. So it was a good weekend. How about you? Yeah, not too bad. I missed Guy Fawkes Night, which is our fireworks, our equivalent of the 4th of July in the UK. Yeah, remember, remember the 5th of November. There you go. Not many, not many Americans know that. So, so well done. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Hey, I've seen I've seen V for Vendetta. I still haven't. I still haven't, and I know I should. I need to. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. I I actually was in undergrad. If I I was a history major, shocker. Um, but if I had a specialty, it would have been sort of Tudor Stewart England that time frame of Guy Fox. So um, so anyways. Great. So we'll jump right in with Newsom's visit to China. We saw the governor visit various subnational government figures around the country, as well as visiting President Xi focusing on cooperation on climate change as the central thrust of his visit. This is the first such visit by a U.S. governor in four years, coming at a time, of course, when engagement is often seen as a dirty word for U.S. politicians talking about China. So, Kelly, does this sort of subnational diplomacy happen often? Does it, does it accomplish very much? Well, this is an interesting topic for us to chat about because we did a working group on this very topic of subnational diplomacy a few years ago here at ISD. And it's it's something that comes in kind of fits and starts. I mean, you, you know, if you want to call it subnational diplomacy or city diplomacy is something that's been around for a long time. I mean, even during the the Cold War, uh, the US and, and China or the Soviet Union had sister cities and things like that. So there's always been some sort of connection, even when you do have this type of competition going on between countries. But, uh, you know, subnational diplomacy sort of came back into the fray again during the Trump administration mostly around climate change um, and uh, had, you know, California played a center role in that because the, the, the governor at the time, Jerry Brown, was sort of pushing back against the Trump administration's leaving the Paris Climate Accords. And California was still front and center leading the way in climate change when the United States maybe wasn't at that time. So that was an episode of subnational diplomacy um, city diplomacy, uh, kind of leading the way on those sorts of things. So this is something that happens often. So with subnational diplomacy or city diplomacy, you have to keep in mind a lot of times that it's different than government diplomacy or just government action at the federal level. Because you know, there's a saying in city diplomacy and in city governance that you know governors and and mayors just they got to get the, the they got to get the potholes fixed. And so it's a little bit different than than government at the national level in many instances. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing here. Um, it, we also have to remember that California is like the seventh or eighth largest economy in the world, if it was its own country. So there's obvious reasons for somebody like Newsom to go to China to do this. Um, and it's just part of a longer history of California governors uh, interacting with China and making deals. And there's been a lot of deals, especially around climate change and energy science and tech over the past couple decades that have really helped move forward science and technology around uh, green energy. And so that on that front, it's a very good thing. And uh, Newsom was also able to re-up some of these MOUs and memorandum of understandings with the Chinese and, and get some of these science and tech cooperation things moving forward again, which is very positive stuff um, on the climate change angle. And I think it's important to remember, you, you know, at times like during the Trump administration, a lot of these subnational government actors would be at odds with the government, their, their federal government at times. But in a case like this, I think 
you know, this is kind of laying the groundwork in some ways for Biden's meeting with Xi at the end of this month at the APEC meeting in San Francisco. And it's also, I think, you know, fits in with sort of the broader national security strategy that the U.S. came out with last year, where they talk about, yes, we have these geopolitical competitions going on, whether or not it's with Russia or China, but we also have these transnational issues like climate change that aren't going to be able to be fixed unless we work with China. Um, So I think this is all part of that um, and fits into that broader strategy at the federal level as well. So, I mean, I know there's people would have liked to have seen Newsom, you you know, maybe hit the Chinese a little bit more on human rights issues and things like that. Maybe not completely bowl over a small child playing a pickup basketball game, which never looks good. Um, But I think, you know, on the whole, I think he was going for, you know, tangible victories that uh, moved forward the, the climate change agenda. And I think he was able to successfully do that. I never thought I would see Gavin Newsom do the same video blooper as Boris Johnson did when, when he was prime minister. Yeah, it's not something I guess you aspire to. So next we have another China-related story, which is the Biden administration's nuclear talks, which were held on Monday the 6th. The administration held a pretty unlikely series of meetings uh, with China on nuclear arms control as the U.S. seeks to head off an arms race with the Beijing-Moscow alliance. According to U.S. officials, it focused on ways to reduce the risk of miscalculation. And according to reports from the Pentagon released this year, the 500 nuclear warheads China currently maintains will grow to 1,000 by 2030. So this looks good, Kelly, is it? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I mean, there's no way really around that. Um, Whenever you're having talks to sort of control nuclear arms. I think it's a good thing. And, you know, I think, again, as with the Newsom story, I think you're starting to see a lot of activity in regard to talks between the U.S. and Chinese representatives because of the meeting that's coming up between Xi and and Biden later this month. Um, So I think that's sort of laying groundwork and, uh, you know, taking some of the frost off the relationship uh, before they meet. But as far as the arms control talks go, you know, this is something that is is imperative as we move forward in this competition, and is, especially as the Chinese, as you noted, are growing their nuclear arsenal. So it's good to keep in mind when you think about the U.S. and China talking nuclear arms control that, you know, this is something that we did for decades with the Soviet Union. Um, and it really took off after the Cuban Missile Crisis for obvious reasons. And, you know, then throughout the 70s and 80s, you had a series of, of arms control talks and treaties that, that happened. And, you know, part of this is it's not just trying to tap down the number of arms that are out there, the number of nuclear warheads and delivery systems and all that kind of different stuff. But it also allows the United States to get an idea or an inkling sort of of what the uh, what China's nuclear doctrine is like, sort of how they handle this kind of stuff. And it also allows you to have these conversations around nuclear arms and doctrine that hopefully tap down the risk of miscalculation. You know, we all know the stories that happened during the Cold War, whether or not it was the Cuban Missile Crisis or even some things in the early 1980s. That's really scary stuff. And I think, you know, having talks allows you to try to minimize the risk um, when you have these vast nuclear arsenals pointed at one another. So I think, you know, this is a good start. And it's something that U.S. has been trying to do with China for about a decade now to bring them into some sort of nuclear arms control talks. So, uh, you know, I think this is a positive development. Certainly, it really has been. We heard stories recently of Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin calling some of his counterparts and them simply not picking up the phone, which you can't get any worse than that. No, that's never a good thing. So our third story today is yet another China-related story, and we are going to be talking about the administration's recent small islands diplomacy. So at the end of October, the Biden administration brokered a deal between Australia, Google, and nine Pacific island nations to increase those islands' connectivity by laying undersea cables. The deal notably includes the Solomon Islands, with whom China signed a security pact last year. That deal allowed for the Chinese government to park and maintain its vessels in the Solomon Islands harbors for unspecified operations, leading Western analysts to assert that it had opened the way for the PRC's first de facto military bases in the South Pacific. China's deal with the Solomon Islands came alongside a failure by China to execute a similar memo with several other island nations included in the administration's recent broadband infrastructure deal suggesting that the competition between U.S. and China to court these Pacific Island nations is really in full swing. So why, Kelly, do the U.S. and China care so much about maintaining good relations with these states? 
So I think this is really something that you got to look at on on multiple levels. First and foremost, this is just part of the broader competition between China and the U.S. for influence globally. And I think in in specific, when you look at these islands, the U.S. has really been the dominant player in this region since World War II. But in recent decades, there's been, for lack of a better term, a little bit of neglect from the U.S. in dealing with these countries. And, you know, these countries are trying to develop more, trying to get more infrastructure. And and that's why this deal with the, the broadband is a very important deal. And it also, you know, they're very worried about climate change because these islands are literally on the front lines of climate change. And some of them are disappearing as seas rise. So they're really looking for infrastructure and help and tech and know-how on, on how to adapt and mitigate against climate change. So, you know, and they're also part of this bigger game between China and the United States as far as, uh, you know, gaining influence and which systems kind of take hold, which is why, the again, the broadband, the the fact that the broadband is going to be something that's a Western, Western companies, not Huawei, um, not another data collection point for the Chinese is, is a big win. Uh, but we've seen, you know, a lot of activity in the past couple of years over this. Once the Chinese really started moving into these islands in in a bigger way, and especially after the Solomon Islands deal, um, which also various reports out there that it included a large amount of corruption and sort of handing bags of cash to government officials in the Solomon Islands potentially. So, you know, the United States has really stepped up its game, so to speak, in the in the region, and it seems to be paying off. A lot of these island nations as well have started to see a little bit of the negative side of Chinese influence in, in what they're trying to do in some of these countries. So I think that's opened the door for countries like the United States, Australia, New Zealand to really kind of step in and build up these partnerships and get these kind of deals going. And, uh, you know, we've seen that the United States has opened up some embassies, is going to open up another embassy next summer uh, in some of these island nations. So I think it's it, it just goes to show that, you know, this this competition between the U.S. and China really has become a global competition. We're also seeing that they are actually investing in, you know, hard infrastructure that can improve regular people's lives, i.e. broadband cables. And it's not just security, which, of course, kind of plays back against the PRC's kind of claim that they've been ratcheting up their Belt and Road Initiative, or at least until the last few years, were ratcheting up their Belt and Road Initiative to support infrastructure that would help people's daily lives. And it's kind of good to see that side of the competition being engaged too, as well as just that kind of military maritime business. Yeah, it's always good to see when it can improve people's lives and and, and folks just aren't you know a pawn in this greater competition. So that finishes up our headlines roundup for the day. And a lot of you have probably seen the news from the week of October 31st. There was a whole bunch of activity going on around AI and AI regulation. Uh, The Biden administration released their executive order on AI on October 30th, and Vice President Harris visited the UK for talks on AI. And today to give us a little bit of a deep dive into these developments is Andrew Embry. Andrew is an associate professor of the practice and the Gracias Chair in Security and Emerging Technology at Georgetown. He previously served as senior advisor on cyber policy to the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and as Secretary of State John Kerry's speechwriter. We strongly recommend listeners check out his latest book, The New Fire, War, Peace, and Democracy in the Age of AI, co-authored with Ben Buchanan. Let's listen in to my conversation with Andrew. I'd like to welcome to the podcast this week a colleague and friend of mine at Georgetown University, Andrew Embry. Andrew, thanks for joining us and welcome. Uh, It's great to be with you, Kelly. And uh, we were just chatting. I think um, I think you're the first uh, three-time interviewee discussion person on uh, diplomatic community. So uh, you know, at some point, we'll there'll be some sort of nice gift that comes along with that. But uh, yeah, I'm ready for my token jacket. Yes, exactly. So, well, anyways, welcome, and Andrew. Uh, the, you know, the reason we're talking to you about AI today and the flurry of activity uh, from last week is the fact that you have written a book about AI uh, called The New Fire. And in our show notes, we'll put a link to that. We actually talked to Andrew a while back um, and interviewed him about his new book. So, um, you know, you're the our our sort of in-house GU expert on this that we wanted to talk to. So, you know, before we get into like what happened in the past couple of weeks on AI, AI has been front and center in the news in 2023 for a lot of different reasons. Uh, can you walk folks through a bit of the history of uh, artificial intelligence and put some of these recent advances uh, into perspective? 
just up front for listeners, you know, one of the ways I think about AI, and there's no really easy definition to just pin down, is the science of creating machines that can reason well under conditions of uncertainty. And that's been a big decades long project, stretching back at least in its modern incarnation to the late 1950s. It is really tough to define this field because it's ever changing, concepts evolve, a lot of experts themselves disagree. And there are many different applications and subfields of AI. Uh, so, you know, the goalposts are moving and it's, it's difficult to pin down a lot of different definitions. You know, one way to sort of approach this is, and I kind of like to draw on the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency's waves of AI, sort of describe three big waves of AI, just describe, categorize, and explain. And in that first wave to describe, these are really the old sort of classical expert systems that would try to mimic the expertise of a human through step-by-step -step programming. You'd essentially hand code in the expertise of someone like you, Kelly, into one of these systems, uh, and then you'd have an interface and you'd have a set of rules and facts that it could reason over. And this was prominent for a while, but the really big burst of AI activity in recent years has been around modern machine learning. And in our book, The New Fire with Ben Buchanan, we, we give a sort of short definition of this, which is using computers to execute algorithms that instruct machines on how to learn from the data. And it's this ability to learn from the data as opposed to rote execution that really defines modern machine learning. And it's seen an explosion in recent years because of all the computing power, the internet availability of data, and it's really been able to use these systems to train them uh, to do lots of really useful and interesting things. And a subfield of machine learning is called deep learning. And this is a, a set of statistical techniques composed of layers of neurons that sort of loosely mimic the human brain. And that's been behind a lot of recent advances in gameplay, but, but in many other areas. So there's a lot of different shifting definitions. But one thing I put on the table that's important for listeners to understand is a lot of this innovation is happening outside of government in labs and private sector and philanthropy and state and local governments and university affiliated research centers and other labs. So this is a really diversified innovation ecosystem that the government doesn't necessarily drive or control. And that puts a premium on clear communication on the kinds of narratives that develop around these technologies and cultivating translators who can make sense of technical trends and communicate their policy impact, which is a lot of what we do here at Georgetown. Uh, but it certainly puts puts the emphasis on understanding how innovation is changing and the complex trade-offs uh, that are involved in the space. And, and just real quick to follow up on that, can you explain to our listeners, where does chat GPT sort of fall into that? You know, there's all sorts of buzzwords and definitions, but the the sort of people saying AI having a moment right now are often referring to generative AI. And these are AI models that can generate new outputs like images or videos or audio or even code. And these models, you know, if you think about back to the history, you know, it was quite prominent to see progress in image recognition or speech recognition and image classification in the early 2000s. And then in the 2010s to see sort of reinforcement learning uh, algorithms take flight. And right now, generative AI has captured a lot of the headlines. And one of the, you know, one of the noteworthy aspects about this is there are only a few companies that can build some of these what are called foundational models. These are trained at scale, but can perform a whole range of tasks. And some of these models are generative. They can produce their own code and images and videos. And there's a lot of entertaining functions, a lot of education functions that come out of them, but also a lot of risks as well as the benefits. And they come at us at the same time, which is one of the reasons why policy around this is so important and so challenging. Yeah, and that brings us to my next question. I'm laughing a little bit here because I feel like I'm about to like quote a, a superhero movie or something like that. But you know, as you note, AI has the potential for both great advances, but it also holds the potential for great peril. So, can you elaborate on that a little bit? You know, it's helpful to think about AI as a general purpose technology. And if you want to read a great scholar on this, uh, check out Jeff Ding's work because. He's really good at identifying, you know, these are these are fundamental transformations, right? That drive change in our economies. They have many different applications. They integrate and reinforce a lot of innovation in different areas. Uh, and so you have to sort of think about these in different timescales. Imagine the first electric dynamo for industrial use around the 1870s. Thomas Edison getting his patent in the 1880s, and then it didn't light up all of, you know, half of U.S. homes until 1920, 25, I think. 
So that you're talking about many decades of diffusion in an economy. It's really hard to get your mind around all the potential risks and benefits just in the here and now. But we have no choice because you know it's coming at us. You know, a lot of the benefits, right, are, is what makes this uh, technology, this set of technologies, so important. Right, can uh, help us rewrite fundamental physics equations, model the 3D structure of protein that could help with diseases. Uh, there are cases where it, where it helped the paralyzed man walk again. Uh, you could do climate and weather modeling and understand deforestation trends better. Uh, you know, all sorts of interesting things around supply chain and logistics optimization. Uh, and, you know, a lot of good that could do for society across agriculture, transportation and energy. But the risks are, are very real. And there's a helpful way to think about this, which is I think there are three sort of big categories of risks. There are the risks that arise from the models themselves. How reliable are they? You know, how much can we really understand and interpret at the level of individual circuits what's going on? So that's a, that's a very technical endeavor to try to figure out how we bring greater robustness and reliability and transparency to these models. On that, you're talking about like the, the internal, the built-in bias in the modeling systems. Yeah, the, the inner workings of these models, the data they train on, how to understand their outputs. So that's kind of one category of risk, which is the reliability of these models. Then you've got risk from misuse, right? So you might worry about bad actors actually misusing these models for... Uh, for cyber attacks or for spear phishing at scale or disinformation or bio risks. And then you've got a third category of risks that might be called sort of system wide or structural risks when these models and the systems of which they are part become increasingly integrated and diffuse across our societies and our economies or in safety critical infrastructure. And those are risks that are harder to quantify but they're equally important. And so we're trying to grapple in a way with all three at different timescales. And it's a, it's a real challenge for policy, but it's starting to get a lot more attention, which is a good thing because you obviously want to get as most out of the benefits as possible and mitigate the risks across the design, development, and deployment phases of the technology. And that's really important. You can't just focus on one phase. You got to focus across the development cycle uh, and it, you have to put a premium on making sure a lot of communities that are affected for better and for worse are part of these conversations. Yeah. And you mentioned that it's getting a lot more attention. These past few weeks have been very important for AI as far as policymaking goes. And there's been a flurry of activity, whether or not you're talking about the Biden administration's new executive order, there's been G7 uh, statements about it and everything. So can you walk us through a little bit on, you know, what are some of the key takeaways on this um, regarding AI policy and what are these governments trying to do? So we've just seen a, a flurry of activity around around AI safety and security, which is which is really important. And you know, I will say just to give folks a sense of the, the growth in this topic, if you look at sort of publications in this space over the last from 2016 to 2021, there's been something like a 358 percent growth in the number of articles on this. The research community is galvanized more and more around it. Policymakers are focused on it as well. And you've hit on some of the highlights that have been going on. I mean, just on the U.S. side, you know, we've seen both uh, from last year, the, the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. Earlier this year, uh, the NIST put out an AI risk management framework. We had an earlier executive order on, on rooting out bias in these systems. And then we've seen a series of recent developments that have been quite important. The Biden-Harris administration has secured commitments from companies uh, in the summer and in September to share the results, share information, test these systems, report on potential dangerous capabilities, You know, promote more research on AI safety and do more to mitigate risks. So I think that's been important. And that's been enshrined in a number of different international processes. The group of seven nations has what's called the Hiroshima AI process. And that took off uh, earlier this year. And then they met at the leaders level and they've now issued the guiding principles that embody some of these uh, core commitments that the Biden-Harris administration secured from a number of major developers in this space. And of course, recently the Biden administration put out an executive order on AI, which is which is really comprehensive and I think sets the stage for a lot of important work to come, uh, both in the administration, in industry and academia, uh, and internationally, because a lot of countries really are working hard to get the, the regs and the principles right, in part to address risks that we've talked about, in part to set a model for other countries, and in part because it's hard to engage and push back on problematic developments abroad if you don't strengthen your hand at home on a lot of these issues. 
And so a lot of governments are getting involved in this. And we can talk in more detail about the executive order or the, the summit in London on AI safety issues. But, but the big takeaway is, you know, AI is a general purpose technology. It's got a lot of wide ranging applications. Governments are really uh, seized with this agenda now. And they're bringing industry and all these different actors together because, as I said earlier, you know, governments you know, not in the driver's seat when it comes to innovating a lot of these technologies. And so this is an effort to put guardrails around them. And every country sort of sets the balance in a different way. Well, you mentioned that every country sets the balance in a different way. And a large part of the conversation around AI and, and just tech and supercomputing and all of these different things in general has been, it, it keeps getting tied back to the US and China competition. So so what are the Chinese doing in this space? Is it different from what the US and our partners in the West are doing? Um, are they trying to regulate AI? Sort of where are they in comparison to what's been going on in the West? China has been at this, actually the regulation game for a while. They've already put out a series of regulations on recommendation algorithms on deep synthesis on what's you know we've talked about generative ai and they've even come out with some detailed or technical committee guidelines about how to interpret their most recent regulation on generative ai on training data content moderation on what they might consider to be politically sensitive content uh, and so they've really been kind of pushing ahead with regulations on, on all of these areas and as we know from other fields of endeavor you know different uh, companies, different countries, different governments are pushing ahead. And some of these are going to set global standards. There's a first mover advantage uh, in a lot of these conversations. And so you can't always remove the geopolitics from the technical conversations that are at play. And a lot of China's regulations reflect both its awareness of domestic and global developments, public opinion. There's obviously its own ideology, CCP ideology infused in some of these regulations. Uh, and conversations with with developers and think tanks and media. And you you should actually, I would recommend to everybody who's interested in this topic to consult Matt Sheehan's work uh, at the Carnegie Endowment. He's done some really interesting research on how China has approached these regulations. And you know, a lot of this goes back to China's strategic framing on this topic, which is that they sort of see AI as part of the fourth industrial revolution. And if you go back to the first on mechanization and then electrification and then the third what they call informatization now they think we're at the the sort of precipice of a fourth one and they want china wants to try to capitalize on this and they see that they have a sort of set of advantages they think in terms of r d and industrial policy and their manufacturing prowess and so they're translating that into to a lot of pretty detailed uh, uh re re regulations and there are different models out there from the EU, from, from the US and others. And so there's going to be really interesting conversations afoot uh, on the global stage about you know, what this means, both for regulatory harmonization, for innovation and competition, and also for the geopolitics that underpins all of it. Well, I think I, I did just see that the US and China signed an agreement on when, when Vice President Harris was in Britain last week. So do you take that as a good sign on sort of trying to bring this regulation, uh, making it more holistic? So the you're referring to the Bletchley Park statement. This is 20, 28 countries plus the EU, and, and that included China, signed on to this statement about making sure that AI is safe, trustworthy, you know, responsible and human centric. And, you know, there's going to be different approaches to this. At a global level, AI is a big enough technology with enough applications and concerns that we you know, obviously have to have a way of working with other countries and other players to make sure that this technology is developed, designed, and deployed in a way that's safe and effective and responsible. But at the same time, uh, there are important values and principles at stake in the way that uh, regulation and guardrails and principles are formulated. And that's why it's really important from the US perspective that they've taken these steps with company commitments, with the executive order, uh, and, and actually over several years across administrations, to build a foundation for how to govern this technology responsibly. Because as, as I said earlier, it's not just about uh, getting a hold of the risk, governing and mitigating them. It's also about setting standards, setting a model. And in the recent executive order that the Biden-Harris administration put out, uh, there's actually quite a bit of emphasis on democracy affirming technologies like privacy enhancing technologies and actually speeding the use of, of these technologies that allow you to uh, as I put it with some co-authors in one paper, answer questions using data you can't see. Uh, and 
This is really uh, an important technology that's nascent but being developed. There's also efforts in the executive order to look at watermarking uh, of these technologies where NIST would actually develop standards that industry would would hopefully adopt, and then the government would use its buying power to really elevate high quality data and information uh, and to do content authentication in a real way. So there's models out there, and the U.S. is trying to sort of lay its claim to a model that promotes innovation but also mitigates the risks and then leans forward into democracy-affirming technologies that could make a difference, not just at the U.S., but in the way we do AI development and deployment overseas and to meet the sustainable development goals. All right, Andrew Embry, thank you for walking us through AI a little bit and some of the recent activity that's been going on. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, Kelly. It's great to see you. You too. All right, thanks, Andrew. This episode was produced by Freddie Mallinson and Jarrett Dang. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Be sure to check out any episodes you may have missed via our website. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else they listen. Follow us on Twitter at GU Diplomacy and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu, to learn more about our work. I'm Kelly McFarland. Until we meet again.